Well, good morning. Thank you for being here. Thanks for coming out to Malibu on this uh, beautiful morning and being with us at Pepperdine. It's really a thrill and pleasure to have you all here for this important conference and topic. My name is Jay Milbrandt. I am the Associate Director of the Newt Bar Institute, and I direct our Global Justice Program. And for those of you who are new to our community, maybe this is your first time here, you haven't been exposed to very much of what we do at Pepperdine, the Newt Bar Institute is dedicated to uh, understanding and, uh, and learning on uh, the nexus of faith and law. And um, we'll explore, uh, I'll explain a little bit more about that, and um, that's really, I think, what we're exploring here in adoption, is how do these things come together with law, religion, and ethics, and all of these topics intersect in a very important way with the theme of today's conference. I've been asked to bring a greeting to you from the uh, Newt Bar Institute's benefactor, Herb Newt Bar. He wanted to be here with us today. He turned 104 this fall, and so it's a it's a bit of a it's a bit of a trip up the coast from Orange County where he lives. And so uh, he tried and wanted to be here, but uh, it was a little too much of a journey today. But he did want me to tell you hello and uh, that he's he's here in spirit. I also want to introduce you to Dana Zachariah. I know she's in the room in the back corner right now. There she is. She's waving. Many of you probably met Dana by email. She is our, our coordinator for the Institute and uh, has been um, putting together most of this uh, as logistics go. And you also meet Bob Cochran, who's our director uh, and, and professor of law here at Pepperdine. And uh, he'll be with us later this morning introducing the next panel. I want to tell you, uh, as we get going here a little bit more about the Institute and why and how this conference topic came about. The Institute, the New Bar Institute, has both a theoretical and a practical component. On the theoretical end, we, um, we have publications, courses, conferences like this one that explore important questions of how law shapes society or how religion should impact law, if at all. And on the um, on the practical side of things, we develop student projects and programs that serve as an expression of an answer to these questions. I'll give you a couple examples of how uh, our courses at Pepperdine led to the establishment of a legal aid clinic on Skid Row that uh, is really an answer to how lawyers and law can serve the poor and uh, the marginalized in society. Or a global justice program, which I direct, which is placing students around the world in positions addressing human rights and serving what scripture calls the least of these. And so we see these as important things for us to be doing as lawyers, as law students, as people who are engaged in these issues. And this is actually the 12th annual Newt Bar Conference that we've had. We try to have one every year. And uh, this is a really interesting one because it, most of our conferences are either theoretical or they're practical, and this one really has implications in both worlds, and it's very, very relevant. Uh, and to tell you a little bit about how this came about, and uh, this conference is sort of theory and discussion, but it came out of a very real and practical um, project that we're working on. Our, our global justice program has been collaborating with the Ugandan judiciary for the past seven years, and this has on a regular occurrence brought us into the family division of the high court. And uh, this is a court where many foreigners are pursuing the adoption of Ugandan children, and for good reason. It's a country that has had, has desperate needs and has lost, uh, the children of Uganda have lost their parents um, uh, to AIDS and the, the civil, years of civil war that have really ravaged that country in a lot of ways. And so there are, uh, there are important needs there, and adoption is one of those um, avenues that people have pursued to be helpful. Uh, but one of the challenges is that uh, for us and for those who are trying to adopt is that judges in the same courts are interpreting the law in different ways that have dramatically different outcomes. And so this, this led us to asking more questions about what's going on and, and really showed us a, and, and introduced us to a lot of you who uh, shows that this is a broad web and network of questions around the world, not just in Uganda. And so this conference really spawned out of that, asking questions about what's happening there, and then seeing how we could help answer that question and uh, be a part of that conversation on a larger scale. And so here we are today, and this matter is timely and it's relevant. Uh, I, I think of some things I just heard in the last few days and, and uh, in recent months. I, I saw a tweet from Pastor Rick Warren at Saddleback just yesterday that stated, 
There are 136 million orphans in the world, but over 2 billion Christians. Adoption is the answer, he declared. And many, many families are, are following that call uh, to adoption as an expression of faith. Um, we've seen other very public expressions of adoption here in the Malibu community from, uh, from figures of, of sometimes Malibu residents like Angelina Jolie and Madonna. <laughs> so another very uh, pop culture exp expression of what that looks like, for better or worse. And um, on, the, on the other end of the spectrum, we've seen uh, this year, uh, this July, at a conference in Africa on the, the African Child Policy Forum, you know, Janet Museveni, the, the First Lady of Uganda, who said uh, that uh, adoptions facilita facilitating trafficking, prostitution, um, and, and slavery around the world. And so these are very polarized. Uh, it's a very polarized topic in some spheres, and people are taking different positions. And so we have this tension. And um, we invite everyone to this conversation. And uh, this is a conversation. And you, many of you and some of you have noted the controversial nature of our conference title, and it was intended to be a bit provocative. And, and I, it got many of your attention. Uh, but the subtitle does present two extremes. And there are people that hold positions all along this spectrum. And so we hope this is a conversation that will be productive and thoughtful. So now I'm happy to introduce our, our plenary uh, speakers this morning to kick us off. First, you'll hear from David Smolin. He is the Harwell G. Davis Professor of Constitutional Law and the Director for the Center of Children Law and Ethics. They have a new center at his law school that's different from what's in the, the brochure. It's the Center for Children Law and Ethics. At, uh, Cumberland Law School at Samford University. He's taught at adjunct and visiting professors at Beeson Divinity School of Samford, at Regent University Law School, Handong International Law School, and School of Public Policy and Health at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. He works extensively in analysis and reform of adoption systems and practices. And then after uh, Professor Smolin, you'll hear from Elizabeth Bartholet, who's the Morris Wasserstein Professor, a public interest professor of law at Harvard Law School and faculty director and founder of the Child Advocacy Program. She teaches civil rights and family law, specializing in child welfare, adoption, and reproductive technology. Before joining the Harvard faculty, she was engaged in civil rights and public interest work, first with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and later as founder and director of the Legal Action Center. Great opening panel for you, and uh, look forward to this conversation starting. Thank you. I am honored to open. You are, uh, I'm sure, a very knowledgeable group. I'll try to be direct and to the point. I want to thank the conference organizers, of course, and all of you for being here. Uh, I hope this will be a part of a broader set of conversations. I've been in this broader set of conversations for probably 14, 15 years now, and I'm sure they will continue, and I see a number of old friends and people that I've known for a long time and grateful to see you all. Intercountry adoption is unraveling. It's melting down. The numbers are down. To the US, we've gone from the high of 23,000 or so in 04 to about 8,700. Peter will tell us about the international numbers, but since the US was about half of the total for the globe, that brings the whole global total down quite a bit. But it's not just that the numbers are down, it's this constant drip drip of bad news. The Russian ban, Cambodia still closed, Vietnam still closed, the State Department saying don't adopt from Nepal. And it goes on and on and on in that way. My position has been more or less the same for many years, which is that the system we have now will inevitably blow up. I've been saying that year after year after year. If you run a system without limits on money, without agency accountability, with impunity, when wrongs occur, then in country after country, it will blow up. I used to feel overwhelmed. The people who are promoting intercountry adoption as an inherent good have a lot more money, agency money a lot more prestige. The government 
People travel all around the world. But I tell you, you're chasing the wind. You're chasing your tails. As long as we run the system by this set of rules that we in the United States created, it will blow up on you again and again and again. This is essentially a cycle of abuse. This is slash and burn adoption. Go from country after country, harvest children to spoil the field. It gets closed. It's over. Now, what are these flaws that I have identified? Number one, controlling the money. The US has a long history with this. When the Hague Convention was being created from 1988 to 1993, it, there was a primary focus even back then on the problem of child trafficking. One of the fundamental stated purposes in the preamble and in Article I of the Hague Convention is to create safeguards to prevent the abduction, the sale of, and traffic in children. And whether we debate the term trafficking versus sale of children till the end of the day, they're both bad things, we can agree, I think. And so that was a stated concern. Child trafficking in Latin American adoptions was a primary focus. If you look at the preparatory materials, particularly the Von Loon report by the Secretary General of the Hague Conference, the subject of abusive practices there was only one chapter on abusive practices in the Van Loon report. It was child trafficking. And he identified what I later came to call child laundering, children obtained by force, fraud, or funds. Children who are kidnapped, children where the parents are tricked out of the children, uh, the education scam, falsification of documents, the children then being labeled as true orphans and then being processed through the official system. So all this was laid out in the, in the preparatory materials to The Hague way back then, borrowing language from the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which says that you should combat the abduction, the sale of, and traffic in children for any purpose. Now, that safeguard system is one that, in some degree, the United States corrupted at the outset. In the negotiations, we insisted and this is publicly stated in the report by our chief negotiator, on there being for-profit entities involved. Although there are only seven currently approved by the US government, that set the conflict at the beginning. The convention is seeking to limit the monetary financial aspects, a number of provisions, Article 8, Article 32, you can look them up, about reasonable compensation. And the US is there negotiating, insisting we have to be able to have for-profit entities involved. And I'm not saying that all for-profit entities are bad, but that set the conflict. Now, of course, the US took from 93 to 08 to implement the Hague and went through this process of the 2000 Intercountry Adoption Act, the State Department reg uh, process that went through 03 to 06. But out of that process, several things emerged. One of them was that the United States, even in the Hague implementing regulations, which only govern a minority of adoptions even today, uh, because you know, the majority of our adoptions are non-Hague adoptions, uh, defined reasonable compensation as normed against intercountry adoption in that field. And so that means we already had swallowed the notion that people could get paid a lot more. The Guatemalan lawyers from, from around 06 to 08 getting paid fifteen dollars to $20,000 per child becomes normatively OK under a regimen like that, which of course never applied to them because we didn't have the Hague yet and because those were non-Hague adoptions. But that becomes normative because that's the going rate for intercountry adoption. So you can go into a country where a social worker might earn two or $3,000 a year and offer $5,000 to $20,000 per child, and that totally tilts away the incentive system. And of course, that's not just about for-profits, that's about non-profits, that's about facilitators, that's the way the whole system operates. So when I have gone to US government officials and asked them, can we have monetary limits? Can we enforce India's limits, which they post on their website? In a context in which uh, a colleague of mine documented that almost every agency working in India was paying far more than India had published as its limits, I was constantly told, no, the Intercountry Adoption Act does not authorize specific monetary limitations. Then there's the accountability side of things. 
again, there were proposals through the Hague implementation process between 2000 and 2006 that U.S. agencies, adoption service providers, would be responsible for what their facilitators and what their partners in other countries did, keeping in view that for the United States as a receiving country, some of the most critical acts, the determination of adoptability by the child, the taking of the consent, and the child study form by which we, uh, by which we discern the special needs of, of the child as well as whether they are truly adoptable, those are handled in the country of origin. But what happened is, again, in the end, in 06, the U.S. State Department created a loophole in a category of unsupervised providers, which allows U.S. adoption agencies to basically not be responsible for the child study form and for the adoptability of the child. In addition to that, there was a debate over waivers of liability during this period of time. Would adoption agencies be able to disclaim liability? The mainstream agencies such as HALT said that they could not operate unless they could disclaim identified liabilities. And the ultimate regulation came out that as long as the agency identifies what the risks are, it can put the risks on the adoptive family and disclaim liability in its contracts. And I see contracts all the time that certainly do that. And so, unlike a field like child labor where we make Apple or Microsoft responsible for their supply chain, if I can put it that way. Adoption agencies are able to disclaim responsibility when the children are not orphans, and they're able to disclaim responsibility when the child study form is not accurate as to age or the special needs of the child, which is not only important as to the issue of children who are not true orphans, but is very, very important in uh, nations like Russia, where the children are, I would agree, oftentimes being horribly harmed in poor quality institutional care, Many of them uh, dumped into institutions, fetal alcohol syndrome, post-institutionalized child problems, cognitive, relational, emotional, educational problems. And it's critical to find a family that can handle those needs. But you can't find a family that can handle those needs if you don't have an accurate child study form. And so, it ends up in the hands of the adoptive family to try to figure it out. Uh, let me talk about the U.S. government being accountable as well, okay, because this is another frustration of mine. That laptop over there has interviews with 20 birth mothers from Ethiopia who lost their children between 06 and 07 to U.S. Ad adoption agencies who told them building on the fundamental misunderstanding about what is adoption between Ethiopia and the U.S., and I'll talk about that misunderstanding, that this was sort of like boarding school. They'd have complete access to their children. They would still be their child. They'd have these advantages of having a child here in the U.S., and they would get constant uh, contact with their child, and on that basis. Now, I challenge, and of course, we've seen that story again and again in Ethiopia. What do I do with those interviews? Will Senator Landrieu help me with that? Will the State Department do anything with that? Is there any recourse for those mothers who want contact with their children? Now, I've seen that case again and again. I saw it in my own case. I, my case of my own adoptive daughters. That's what I mean by impunity. A system where you can steal children and it doesn't matter because they're citizens now and they're here will blow up on you again and again and again. So until you create a system where it matters that there are mothers over there whose children were stolen and there are children over here who are the ones who were stolen, then, you know, it's going to blow up on you. So I don't feel overwhelmed anymore. I feel like a broken record. It'll probably be 7,000 next year with the Russian ban. 
Now, I want to talk about this from a religious point of view for a little bit. I know that this is sort of the two hats that I wear. Because it's particularly ironic that the evangelical Christian adoption and orphan care movement has come onto the scene in the last five years, years of profound decline in intercountry adoption. There was the opening quote from Saddleback Church about 130 million orphans in the world and two billion Christians and how we can take care of that problem. And what I want to do is go over some information about what adoption is. And I want us to think about that from a theological lens for those of you who are inclined, but also the fundamental question of what is adoption, because you can't really have an intercountry adoption conference without talking about what adoption is. I talked about Ethiopia a moment ago and the two fundamentally different viewpoints of what adoption is. Here in the United States, we have something called as-if adoption, or full closed record adoption, which was really created between, say, 1940 and 1980. Now, I know we have open adoption, and some states, such as my state, Alabama, has access. But what we developed in most states between 1940 and 1980 was this situation where you are not related to your original family when you're adopted, none of them, grandparents, siblings, etc., and where your adoptive family is given a new birth certificate, and it's as if, legally, you were born to them. And where, of course, that record is sealed. And even the adopted person does not have a right to their identifying information. And that's the law in most states and continues to be a big issue in adoption. And that's a certain kind of way of, con of conceptualizing relationships in what's the so-called adoption triad. Now, in a society like Ethiopia, and in many other societies, adoption is understood more as adding family members than subtracting, if I can put it that way. In, in simple adoption as a comparative law term, uh, you're still related to your original family, and then you take on new fathers and, and also new mothers. And actually, Ethiopian law says that in its English language code. Being, it, it's quite blunt about that, but of course, that's just a cultural understanding. That's one of the things that makes it very easy to extract children in many countries is they don't understand what it means to, quote, give up a child. And it's not really being explained to them, and it would be difficult for them to understand, even if we try to explain it to them, because it doesn't make sense to them that you can sign a piece of paper and that's not your child. It's just, it's just ludicrous. It's countercultural. Now, in that context, um, thinking about this problem, we can see pretty clearly, of course, if you look historically, that this secret shame-based, closed-record system, which we're end-running around all the time with open adoption and so forth, was created for the, for the situation of the unwed mother in a time of great shame. That was who was supposed to be protected by it. But I want to look at basically this question of what is adoption from a biblical lens, because I want to propose to you that at the outset that Ethiopia is right and we're wrong from a biblical lens, at least, for those of you interested in such. And this is a religion and law conference, and we're going to be doing that as we go on. And I find this particularly ironic because one of the flaws of the Christian adoption movement is it hasn't asked what is adoption in the Bible. And so I'm going to take you through a quick tour, and I'm going to ask you to think about these two ways of understanding adoption. First of all, in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament, there is no law of adoption in the law of Moses. There's no law among the 600 plus laws where one can transfer a child and their lineage from one family to the other. I always find it ironic that Christians say adoptions in, in the Bible look at the adoption of Moses, because if you look at the adoption of Moses, it's all about rejecting his adoptive identity. The New Testament book of Hebrews, basically the quotation, if you want to look at it, is that, Mo, is that quote, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. By faith Moses, when he, had, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I don't have time to go over the whole story. I presume many of you know it. But you know, Moses is one of the major figures in world history, and the whole thing turns on him embracing his original Hebrew identity. In the other sort of adoption in the Old Testament is that of Esther by her uncle or cousin Mordecai. I love the story. There's not time to go over it. But what's very important to understand is that Esther is an instance of a true orphan. Her parents are dead. And the word adoption is not used in the Hebrew text, but the text says, Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter. And so the point is that Esther is always identified, accurate, is always identified accurately as her, with her birth father. 
And if you look at the moment or the test of faith for Esther, you know Esther is the story of the Jews under siege, as they have so often been throughout world history and in Bible times as well. And Esther has to go to the Persian king who she is married to. She actually has a wonderful relationship with her, uh, if we call it, adoptive father with her uncle who takes her as a daughter. I mean, it's one of the most beautiful uh, father-daughter relationships in the scriptures. I mean, you can just see his worry and concern for her. So when I talk about all this, please keep in mind that I am an adoptive parent. Uh, my wife and I are parents of eight children, two of them adopted. And so it's not that I don't have a heart for the potential for adoption as a very positive relationship. And, and, but understand that in the context of trying to understand what adoption is, to the degree this was an adoption, which again, it couldn't have been under Jewish law because there was no such thing, Esther is told when she's wavering whether or not to go to the king and risk death or whether to not go and save her own life but see the rest of her people perish. She's told that salvation will come from the Jews from another place if you don't go, but you and your father's house will perish. Again, her birth father, as far as one can tell from the text. That's who she's identified with despite this wonderful... So she's added a father without subtracting. Now, if you look at orphans in the Old Testament, going on to the Old Testament survey, because this is all supposed to be about orphans. The Hebrew word is yatom. It's used 42 times, and it means essentially the fatherless or the orphan. And if you look at the uses of it, you see that it generally is part of a dyad, the widow and the orphan. And in fact, this is the critical misunderstanding. And it's a misunderstanding that's exemplified by the way we do adoptions in Uganda, the DRC, as well as what the Christian adoption movement thinks. The prototypal fatherless or orphan is with the widow. They are a unit. It's the widow and, and the orphan. So when James in the New Testament says to an undefiled religion is to visit the orphan and the widow in their distress, they're talking about a unit that lacks a father, male, husband, protector. I've got an article on this by the Region International Law Review, free on my BE Press website. Just go to Google my name, BE Press. It goes, gives you all the details, all the citations that you could want on this point. This is very much brought out by the way that Elijah, Elisha in 1 Kings, 2 Kings, and Jesus in Luke handle the widow-son dyad. Because if you want to know what a text telling you what to do means, you look at what the exemplary people do. So Elijah, Elisha, and also Jesus encounter widows with dead sons, and raise them and restore the son to the widow or with sons who are in danger of being taken away because of lack of wealth and they provide the wealth so the widow can keep her son. That's what orphan ministry is in the Bible. It's widow ministry or it's widow and orphan as a unit. Okay. This goes to the fundamental question which is is intercountry adoption, even if you don't have what I've called child laundering or child trafficking, ethical if it's based on poverty? I've heard um, many proponents of intercountry adoption argue that it is permissible to adopt because of the poverty of the original family. And I read reports constantly from Haiti, Ethiopia, Uganda in this day of more openness where American white Christians go and they actually meet the mother and they say, gosh, she's so poor and here she is with her child. Y'all read those? And I wonder if I should just give her money and no, no, I guess not. You know, uh, so she could keep her child. Uh, uh, and so this is a constant live issue. In fact, this comes up as our adoptive children grow up. At, uh, my wife and I, Desiree, spoke to about a, about a year and a half ago through the kindness of Tom, the head of the Joint Council of International Children's Issues that has a strong link to adoption agencies, used to be considered essentially the trade group for uh, uh, adoption agencies. Now I feel that Tom is moving it almost away from intercountry adoption because there aren't going to be so many intercountry adoptions and he needs, they need to have other things to do. But, but basically, at the plain recession, um, it was remarkable. Uh, several people publicly said and recounted a conversation like this from their adoptive child, either talking about their clients or talking about actually themselves. Why was I adopted? 
And you know this is the core thing because you know, the point of adoption is that most adopted people come to ask at some point in their life, why didn't my family keep me? And this has to do with this core understanding that one of the core issues of adoption is loss, that adoption is a relative good, not an absolute good, because it's like a heart transplant. It's radical surgery, okay? And it can be life-saving, and it can be beautiful. But when the child comes uh, and then is told, as was recounted, you were adopted because your family was poor. Well, why didn't you give money to my mother? Okay, these actual conversations recorded. And instead of the agency people and the head of the Joint Council saying, you know, this is a wake-up call to you and I, that, you know, maybe we're not doing this right, because if that's our answer, and that's what we have to tell to our children, you came to me because, you know, I, you were poor, and when they ask, why didn't you help your mother, I don't have an answer. Well, you know, that was the agency doing that part. I did the other part, or whatever answer. You, uh, I teach bioethics. And in teaching bioethics, there are certain images that I have. One of them is, and I know this is going to be very, very harsh, okay, but it's going to make my point, is the Nazi doctors as they did the freezing experiments. And you have a man who's a doctor sitting by a tub as he freezes a prisoner to death as a human research subject's experiment. Now, I submit to you that being able to go to another country, sit with the mother who is losing her child, simply because of poverty, and take the child home requires a similar numbing of the conscience. And to, con and to construct a system where that is normal and is repeated as being normal and where those involved in the system are numbed to that is a kind of a numbing of the conscience. And it particularly grieves me to see Christians who purport to be there for the widow and the orphan for the poor, exploit the poor and the widow in the name of the orphan. Now in the New Testament, there are no adoptions done. There's no example. You can talk about Jesus and Mary and all that, but if, if Mary was a birth mom, then Jesus would have been taken away from her, you know, and you know, Joseph is a, you know, the legal father by marriage, and if, you know, similar to anything, it's a step-parent adoption, but it's not a stranger as if adoption, okay? Uh, and, and it's odd that the Christian adoption movement feels this tremendous impetus to go out and adopt all of these children when there are only five uses of adoption in the New Testament. They're all about our relationship to God. I don't have time to go all over all of them. They're all in the Pauline texts. Three of them are in the book of Romans. And basically, if you look at what those texts mean, because they're not referencing the adoption of children, they're referencing the individual's relationship to God, and they're only in the Pauline texts, they're really referencing Roman adoption. And if you know anything about Roman adoption, you know that Roman adoption had nothing to do with adopting poor, vulnerable orphans. It had to do with emperors adopting or designating out of their stepchildren and out of their nieces, nephews, and so forth, who would be the next emperor. It's all about the inheritance. And the message of those five Pauline texts is that the honor of being God's child is greater. The inheritance we have as being God's child is greater than the inheritance and the honor that we have as being uh, you know, the emperor of the whole Roman Empire or the son of the emperor or the one who's going to inherit that. That's Paul's message. There is widow ministry in the New Testament. It's a pretty big theme. But show me an adoption in the New Testament. Now, I think we're a little bit over profitable in the U.S. I want to end with two things. Although we think we have enough adoptive parents to take care of the whole world, it is well known that there are 100,000 plus children waiting to be adopted from the U.S. foster care system. And I am a big backer of the Christian adoption movement and any adoption movement of any religion, if I can put it this way, targeting those children for adoption. I think that absolutely needs to be done. We need to take responsibility for those children here in the United States. It is also a strange fact, if you think money has nothing to do with, with adoption, how do you explain 200 plus children leaving the United States to go to Canada, the Netherlands, and so forth for inter-country adoption, the US as a nation of origin? And here the tables get turned. We certify that there are no people to adopt these babies. 
Well, why? Well, they're black babies, but you're going to Ethiopia and Uganda and DRC, do it. what's going on here? Well, could, and here we lambast other countries because they don't have accurate figures about what's happening in their country. We don't have accurate figures about how many children are leaving the United States to go to Canada. Canada says a much higher number than we say on the US State Department website. And could it have anything to do with the fact that these children leave the US that if they go to Canada, they're worth tens of thousands of dollars, but in the US adoption market, is, they're not worth a whole lot. Does that have anything to do with it? Or do we buy the other explanation, which is given that these mothers are choosing to send their children to Canada because it's a bad environment for a black child to be in the US? So again, then why are we bringing thousands of black children into the US? However you try to reconcile it, it's a strange phenomenon. Okay. So we say we're going to save the world even as we, I submit to you, have fundamentally corrupted the U.S. adoption system, I mean the inter-country adoption system. We've broken it down in country after country with our way of bringing unlimited numbers of agencies with unlimited number of funds competing for children. We corrupt inter-country adoption. We don't take care of the children who need adopted in the United States. And yes, there are wonderful, wonderful, wonderful stories of inter-country adoption. And I have to say, I understand. And I do understand that, you know, like with the Russian ban, why did that happen? Russia did a bad thing. I wasn't for that ban. I'm not for that ban. But um, trying to figure out a good way to end since I've got the one minute signal. I have a prediction, okay? The rules are not going to be changed to limit the money. The rules are not going to be changed to make agencies accountable. We're not going to change the unsupervised provider loophole. We're not going to change the waivers of liability loophole. We're not going to authorize an amendment to the Intercountry Adoption Act to allow monetary limits. We're not going to change the uh, definition of reasonable compensation for intercountry adoption. We're going to continue to go and open up dicey countries like Uganda and, and the DRC, and the, and the numbers will go up, but the overall numbers will continue to come down. I just pray and hope that not too much damage is done along the way. Thank you very much. Mr. Professor. Bartlett comes up, I'll, I'll mention that uh, we're reserving about 10 minutes at the end for questions, and then both of our speakers will be in on breakout sessions later, and those breakout sessions have more of an opportunity to interact, to talk, to have a conversation, which is what our goal is for that, and so um, if you don't get your question in in those 10 minutes, you'll have a chance later, and uh, hopefully there'll be lots of discussion throughout the day. Um, okay, that's me, Betsy Bartholet, and um, I'm really pleased to be here. I um, am pleased to be here in large part because I think this is a really important audience, including um, a lot of people, really all of you could make an enormous difference on the issue of international adoption. And for me, that means you could make an enormous difference for children um, if you pushed the policymakers in ways that made um, international adoption something that actually happened more regularly to give children homes. So, um, Let's move to my second slide. I only have two. I don't do PowerPoint. But um, my title, um, The International Adoption Cliff, Do Child Human Rights Matter? Can we get the second one? Um, that's my title, The International Adoption Cliff, Do Child Human Rights Matter? So the cliff, um, six decades from 1944 to 2004, of course, that line isn't dead straight. It bumped up and down, up and down. It went steadily up for six decades. These are adoptions into the United States, um, some 22,000 at its peak in 2004. 
in less than one decade, I have at the very bottom the projected figures for 2013 will be roughly, people are projecting, this year we'll have about one third of the number of kids coming into this country that we had in 2004. So less than a decade, we dropped by two thirds the numbers from a peak that represented a steady incline for six decades. Um, worldwide, it's more, it, there's a cliff, but it's more dropping to uh, maybe somewhere between half and two thirds of the peak. But the U.S. has always been the biggest um, in terms of bringing kids into this country. So an enormous and hugely significant, um, significant to children decline. Now, what does that cliff represent? To me, it represents devastating human rights tragedy. So it represents tens of thousands of kids whose lives are being systematically destroyed um, and deliberately destroyed by government and by non-governmental organization policy. It represents really hundreds of thousands of kids per year because we could have taken the number at its peak, so over 20,000 into this country, 40,000 worldwide, roughly speaking. We could have taken that and multiplied that number by 10 or by 100 easily if we had adoption regulation that facilitated rather than put barriers up if we had adoption regulation that facilitated international adoption. So what we've had all along is enormously restrictive regulation. It would be easy with facilitative regulation to give hundreds of thousands of kids per year the nurturing homes that international adoption provides. Now, um, second, second half of my title, do child human rights matter? And I would say apparently not to the policymakers. apparently not. Um, foreign governments and the US government, UNICEF and other uh, organizations that go by the name of child human rights, save the children, you can name a lot of them. Um, they are um, all responsible for shutting down international adoption, even though they would all say that they have to do with human rights. So do child human rights matter to us, to, to us in this room, enough for us to do something to take action, to turn things around. So I'm gonna say um, some more about the nature of this cliff, why it's happening. Um, and I don't share the idea with David that it's necessarily gonna keep going down. I think this is an enormously retrograde, not a progressive, but a retrograde movement that is proclaiming kids belong in the country they came from and they ought to stay there. And I don't think this trajectory is gonna go down to zero, but it could. That's why it matters what we do, those of us in this room. So, um, so more on the cliff. Why do I say that it's a devastating child human rights tragedy and that it's deliberately caused? So in my view, international adoption represents the provision of nurturing homes, the kinds of homes that human children need to grow up, not only enjoying their childhood, but capable of enjoying the rest of their lives and the human rights we say that we guarantee adults. Kids need nurturing homes to grow up. Social science has demonstrated over and over that kids don't grow up healthy and capable of good future lives if they grow up in institutions. If you look at the social science, you know that overwhelmingly international adoption works for kids. You know that the incidents that the media and the policymakers make a lot of, the abuse of a given child, the putting of a child back on that plane to Russia, those are extraordinarily tiny examples of abuse in the larger picture. Overwhelmingly international adoption works for children, it works best when they're placed in infancy, so something you don't see on the cliff, and we can take the cliff down. They've absorbed the cliff, and now it went blank, so you'll look at me. Um, uh, one thing you don't see on the chart is that in today's world, children are no longer placed as infants. They are placed to the degree they're placed as two, three, or older, five, six-year-olds. So what we have in, in this world is not only policy that pulling those numbers down, but policy that requires that children be systematically destroyed 
before they're so lucky as to enter an adoptive home. And then we can see if the adoptive home can make up for the damage. Well, it can, it does, but it doesn't make up for all the damage, it can't. Um, when you don't place kids until you've waited for them to be systematically destroyed. So, um, now, again, why, why is this a human tragedy? Because we've got an institution capable of providing nurturing homes to kids growing up in institutions who are in desperate need of those homes. Um, the need for those homes is ever greater. We have an increased number year by year of kids growing up in institutions, an increased number of orphans, of kids unparented, I prefer the term unparented kids, kids who simply aren't getting parents. Whether there is an existing biological parent or not, they're not being parented. Increased number of that. So they say there's something between 8 and 12 million kids growing up in institutions. Interesting that nobody knows the numbers. Too many to count for the people who are in charge of counting those things. Um, so um, there are many who say, and many at this conference you'll hear from, um, oh, it, let's do in-country things for those kids. Even if in-country options, like foster care, were, which UNICEF promotes, were better for kids, in-country fo foster care is not better for kids. So I think the social science makes completely clear. Um, even if some of these options existed and were better because they're in country. There's more than enough, sadly, tragically, there's more than enough kids in need of homes. I don't think anybody who's being honest can say that the in-country options in any near future could be grown to an extent to serve the needs of the kids in need of parenting. Um, so we've got... Um, all these kids in need of homes. Now, is there a huge capacity? Yeah, there's a huge capacity to provide homes. There's something in the range of 15% of all couples who try to have kids can't have them. There's tons of other people who, even if they don't suffer from infertility, would love to become adoptive parents if the world was saying to them, hey, there's a need. Would you like to meet it? Would you like to do this soul-satisfying thing called parenting a child who actually needs a home. Um, there's a ton of people out there already, even in today's world. So today's world, what do prospective adoptive parents face? Well, they face long waits, they face huge expense, and they face significantly and often horribly damaged children, damaged by the institutional life that they've suffered and other things they may have suffered prior to institutional life or instead of institutional life. Um, so we still got lots and lots of parents begging for the opportunity to give homes despite current conditions. So if we had adoption-friendly regulation that actually encouraged, facilitated the placement of kids in need with people who wanted to become parents, facilitated placement early in life when kids um, had a much better chance for a good future life, uh, it, the numbers are, you know, the numbers would be huge. The numbers could meet huge, huge needs. So here we've got an institution, international adoption, that provided in 2004 40,000 plus homes for kids in desperate need and could provide 10 or 100 times that. It magically transforms the lives of those children from destitution to A-OK, -okay, particularly if they're placed early in life. This is, as somebody who's done social change work all my life, this is an astonishingly successful social program. Most social programs don't work very well. This one works. And another astonishing thing about it is it is, it pays for itself. It pays for itself because it is the people who adopt kids who overwhelmingly pay the expenses. We are not looking to poor countries and saying, hey, you should take your scarce resources and instead of spending them on serving the needs of poor mothers, we want you to spend them transferring these kids to rich people. No. International adoption brings money into countries. It takes the expense of kids off the hands of poor countries. Um, and, uh, you know, although people like David see this money coming in as all evil, this is the only context in which I know, international adoption, people see money coming into poor countries as an evil rather than a good. So. Um, you also have adoptive parents on a regular basis, year after year, a significant percentage of them 
sending money into countries that they would never have given to before because they never knew until they adopted anything, many of them, about the conditions in poor countries. Um, so then, why the cliff? Um, why do I say it's deliberate policy? Um, well, I think in terms of UNICEF and organizations like Save the Children, most of us on the ground working on this issue are very aware that, although they will deny it, um, their policy is systematic shutdown of international adoption. Um, governments, uh, many governments on a regular basis do this. Our government often does participate in the shutdown of international adoption. I think it's somewhat more passive in its sh shutdown motivation, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but it is, if you buy, and I'll give a few more details, that it's deliberate shutdown, then I think what we're talking about here is not just human tragedy on an enormous scale, but evil, because this is deliberate. Okay, so there's tragedy all the time. There's just tons of kids and adults dying of diseases, of poverty, of war, of chaos. This is deliberate man-made tragedy. Let's set out and turn down, shut off this institution that is capable of giving innocent children escape from the conditions of institution and a really good life. Um, so deliberate policy, what have we got? We've got countries of origin very often shutting down international adoption um, out of motives that I believe are usually some mix of national pride. They want to demonstrate they're proud, they're strong. They can stand up to the United States. This is great. You know, we didn't like colonialism. I agree, bad thing, much of what colonialism did. Here's a way to stand up to that colonialist power, um, we can show them they can't have our kids, we can keep our kids. We can make the claim, even if it's not true, that we can take care of our own. So China in recent years, why has China cut back? I think they didn't want to be seen as a third world country, but as a proud, new, strong power player in the world. So we make the statement, we don't need you, Americans or others, taking our kids. We can take care of our own. Africa, the recent African conference, African Child Policy Forum reacted against the increase in African adoptions um, by announcing this is a terrible thing. The trend is take, to take our kids. We're going to shut that down. We are going to make the statement that we African nations can take care of our kids. International adoption should be a last, last resort. Regardless of the fact that there are millions on millions of kids in Africa who will not, I believe, at any near future find nurturing homes. Now, what about receiving countries like the US? I think it's more complicated. I think we usually, when we participate in the shutdown of international adoption, it's, um, it's self-protective. It's national self-interest. It's just a different kind of national self-interest. There's nothing in it for us, the United States government, to be helping kids from other countries. Um, actually, they're little baby immigrants. Why do we want them? But we might want to serve the adoptive parents, but it's not a big deal to the US. So if we might get into trouble at all, if somebody might accuse us of colonialism or baby stealing, much better to shut it down. Doesn't hurt us to shut it down in terms of our national interest. So that's what we do. So I've heard Department of State, US Department of State spokesperson, pronounce that our ethical standards should be not a single ethical violation. We don't want the numbers in Ethiopia to grow, go back up to where they were in, if there's a single ethical violation. Well, the idea of the ethical violation that the US is talking about is in connection with placing kids. What about the systematic? in my view, ethical violations that occur when we shut down international adoption and deny these kids homes. That doesn't seem to count. So DOS, US government, we look better if no kid comes into this country with a suspect adoption. So let's shut it down if there's any risk to us in terms of our national self-interest. Um, UNICEF, in terms of deliberate shutdown, they won't admit it. If you go on the website, they'll set, you'll see the official statement, international adoption can be a last resort. Whenever you say last resort, that effectively makes it last, last resort. But I don't think UNICEF 
even wants it as a last, last resort. If you look at what they do on the ground, if you look at their reports, you can read, several, I've read several UNICEF reports which talk about this terrible dilemma, all these homeless kids, unparented kids in these countries, what should we do? And everything under the sun is named group homes, sibling-headed households, except international adoption. Never one positive mention. Um, so, You haven't given me that yet, right, good. Um, so does international adoption shut down? Does the cliff represent a child human rights violation? So that's my claim. And of course, there are some who would say, no, no, that's a vindication of child human rights. We need to keep these kids in their countries of origin. That serves their interest in heritage. That prevents these terrible abuses. Um, I'm actually not going to address this because I accept in moments, and I'm certainly happy to address these issues in the Q&A. The reason I'm not going to address, you know, don't we shut kids in because of heritage rights? It's absurd. Kids do not enjoy their heritage rights when they grow up in institutions. Um, I don't address adoption, you know, so-called abuses in part because in part because they're not systematic. The systematic abuse is every single kid living in an institution and growing up that way. Of course, there are occasional abuses of the law in the area of adoption as they are in every area of human life. This is the only one where we shut down the institution and we imprison the innocent, the children, rather than going after the perpetrators of the law violation. So why do we do it? Believe me, I believe UNICEF and uh, many others embrace the abuses that happen in the area of international adoption because it's an excuse to shut it down. The motivation for shutting it down is entirely other. So um, that brings me to Russia. So um, there is one thing I like about the tragic Russian recent shutdown which is it helps give the lie to the idea that international adoption shutdowns are ever instituted to serve children's interests. So Russia's leaders at, may, at least made no such pretense. This was a pure power play. Everybody knows it was, tit for tat. We'll take vengeance. We'll punish the United States because they tried to punish um, us, and we'll, we don't want other countries punishing us the way the United States did. Um, a little bit of talk of uh, so sort of national pride. The I like this, commissioner of child rights for Russia said, quote, I think any foreign adoption is bad for the country, not for the kids, but for the country. So at least they're honest. Um, but I think that this is, in fact, the kind of thing that is going on in every single shutdown. It's all adult power play. None of it is about kids' interests. So um, do child human rights matter? Does anyone care enough to act? So the United States government cares at least a little when adult human rights are violated abroad. So here are some examples. The United States Department of State keeps an annual human rights report on all countries in the world. Annual report. Let's check out what's going on in every country. Let's see if there are violations. And we list, DOS lists, as violating human rights a variety of countries and says, what are they doing? Now, this is an important publication. It gets attention. It leads to impact. It is, a, it's of course, a naming and shaming device, but naming and shaming can have action implications. Um, so it can, it can also lead to sanctions, actual economic trade, cut off of military aid type of sanctions. So for example, both Russia and Guatemala, I checked just last week, DOS human rights annual report for the latest year, Russia and Guatemala both listed for things that include arbitrary detention and harsh prison conditions of adults, of course. Now, what about the arbitrary denial of liberty to children represented by institutionalization? What about the detention of children for no reason other than that they got put there in destructive conditions that characterize the institutions in Guatemala and Russia? Does the DOS Human Rights Report list Russia for those? Of course not. Um, if you read 
the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the latter the U.S. signed on to, even if we didn't sign on to the CRC. The, the latter is binding on us. These documents make it completely clear, in my view, that locking kids into institutions and raising them there rather than in a nurturing home is a violation of the most fundamental child human rights, the right to grow up in a family. Um, but never, as best I know, um, ha is, does the DOS Human Rights Bureau list countries for institutionally institutionalizing their children or for shutting down an institution, international adoption that helps children escape from those institutions. Um, so we also have legislative and administrative sanctions. U.S. law actually forbids arms sales and foreign aid to nations guilty of gross violations of human rights. I would think this um, violation of kids' rights ought to be included there. Um, so, so we don't count, our government doesn't count these violations of child human rights as mattering. Um, let's look at the recent Russian example. Why did it happen? It was because the U.S. seemed to care a whole lot about the violation of one adult human being's rights in Russia. So one adult in a prison denied medical care. That's why Congress passed the Majitsky Bill. And then we said we're going to say that certain people involved in de denying that adult his human rights will now not be able to come to the U.S. and own property here. One adult. Now, I'm not saying that was necessarily a wise thing for Congress to do, because it did trigger what Russia did. But what I'm saying is Congress takes it seriously, at least sometimes, when adult rights are violated in other countries, but not when kid rights are. So, um, so why? Well, it's perhaps obvious that you can't expect the United States government to address the child human rights violations that it is to some degree actively responsible for. So the U.S. government helped shut down, just in recent history, some big countries, meaning large numbers of kids de denied homes on a yearly basis, Guatemala, Ethiopia, many others. The U.S. government funds UNICEF. The U.S. government enables UNICEF to implement the anti-adoption policies that it systematically implements, um, funds it every single year. No conditions on that funding that matter, at least, to the child human rights issue that I'm talking about. So we can't expect the U.S. government to do anything, I guess. Or can we? Should we? Could we work for some change in U.S. government policy? U.S. government's a pretty powerful player in the world at large, not Superman, but can make a difference. Could we demand that Congress, the White House, the Department of State work to expand rather than contract the number of homes that international adoption can provide to kids? Could we demand that the Department of State Human Rights Bureau include in its annual reports an analysis of what countries are doing with their children. How many do they have in institutions? Have they shut down international adoption? What's been the impact of the shutdown of international adoption? Are there now more kids in institutions in Guatemala? Are there more kids on the street without homes? Um, could we demand that human rights sanctions be imposed by Congress and the administration on nations identified as not doing as well as they could so easily do in this area by their kids? Could we demand that Congress condition any funding of UNICEF on a change in UNICEF's policy? We could. We should. I think we could make a difference if we and others like us pushed for those things. But will we? So I hope we will. I hope that what I see as child human rights will be what you see as child human rights, most of you. Um, and I hope that we can work together toward these goals. Thank you.